Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, today, I'm going to do a very brief uh, presentation about Persian calligraphy. Now, when I say Persian calligraphy, uh, generally throughout history, it, when we talk about calligraphy, it's often referred to as the art of Muslim people because of the similarity of the Persian script with the Arabic script and the uh, common themes, the common uh, subjects, uh, the common texts which are used, the scripts which are used to uh, uh, do the uh, art of calligraphy, uh, there is an association between Islam and between, uh, between calligraphy. So what I'm going to do is to focus on Persian calligraphy, on the Nasali uh, calligraphy, and uh, go through some of the basic key ideas of, uh, of calligraphy, the, the techniques of it, the requirements for doing, doing some uh, uh, calligraphy as, as a hobby or as, as an art, as something that uh, people might be interested in pursuing in their free time or as some kind of a passion that they would follow. So let me share the presentation with you. Uh, Right, so I'll, I'll, I'll explain the things that you would see on the, on the, on the screens to, to make sure that everybody is following that, the themes that we've got there for those people who don't know Farsi and who are not familiar with uh, the uh, Nasari script and Nasari calligraphy. Uh, the picture on the right is a uh, picture of uh, Mirza Ghulam Reza Esfahani. Mirza Ghulam Reza Esfahani was uh, the, one of the most prominent Persian calligraphers who used uh, to live in the, he, he was a contemporary of uh, the uh, Qajar, the, in, the, in the early uh, years of the Qajar dynasty in Iran. Now, the calligraphy on top is a satr by Osotye uh, Khutrukurush. Uh, the one that we see on the left of the image we see on the left uh, is a Siyamash by Mirza Ghulam Zawistani, and it is a verse by Nazariya Khoistani, the uh, Iranian Ismaili poet who uh, used to live around the time when the Mongol invasion happened in Iraq. So, to begin, I'm going to have a look, but a a brief, brief look at the Nasalik style and, and, and not, 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 not at the other style. So the Nasalik style of calligraphy is said to be Naskh Ta'aliq, as we see it in various uh, uh, works written on calligraphy, particularly with masters of, of Nasalik calligraphy. Now, the Nasalik is an evolution, uh, according to this, this variation, is an evolution of the Naskh script itself. So the Nasr script, the Nasr style of calligraphy is something which is mostly about straight lines and about uh, lines with sharp edges. When you're doing the letters, they do it with, with the straight lines and the sharp edges. So you don't see that much of, of uh, 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 curves, if you like, in the, in the Nasr script. So Nasr primarily turns these straight lines and sharp edges into curves. So you've got a greater degree of flexibility in terms of uh, uh, using the dots and the lines and the curves in the Nasalib uh, script. And when it goes, it takes another step and it goes a little bit further to Shikas the Nasalib, which is yet another style of calligraphy, you see uh, a higher level of uh, uh, introduction of curves into, into the uh, uh, calligraphy of, of uh, Nasalib. Now, when we say Nasr Ta'aliq, I've got to translate this for you. Ta'aliq itself means uh, being in suspension, hanging. So if you want to have an idea of how this looks like, you can imagine a straight hair. Just hold the hair in your hand and keep it hanging. Uh, and if you, if, if you just twist it a little bit, you see the curls which are coming into it. So those curls and the curls that you see in it are basically the idea of ta'ali, when you keep it hanging, when you keep it in suspension, it creates those curves in it, which is why they call it naska ta'ali, and over time it has been turned into nasta'ali. Now, when we talk about nasta'ali, it is, it is an art, of course. It is, it is a field of uh, art, it is calligraphy, but it's not just art, it's more than just an, uh, the practice of the art. Now, Salib, of course, like any other form of art, it takes time, it takes a lot of patience, it takes a lot of passion by people to follow it. So you need to, in the case of Nasali, like many arts, but this one is, has got a particular uh, 
uh, element in it that you need to mentally and physically discipline yourself. Mentally, you need to prepare yourself. You need to be able to align your eyes and your hands with the subject of what you're doing. And as a result, the reason I say mentally uh, disciplining yourself, I consider this to have a spiritual element to it. This is what Sufis would refer to as suluk. So when not every calligrapher, of course, uses it like this, but when we talk about the spiritual element in Nasali and doing calligraphy, you're basically talking about the relationship between the art itself, between what the artist does, between the subject of uh, the art, between the, the, the uh, letters and the words that people choose, the sentences that we take people, people choose, the lines of poetry that people choose, and the kinds of variations they introduce to it. It is, in a sense, uh, going through different stages of progression. And as a result, it, it entails an element of saluk, it entails an element of gradually and over time developing and perfecting the art, which is why I call it, the, why I call, I, I, I think there is a spiritual element to it. Now, in doing the Nasalic calligraphy, your body posture is very much important. Your breathing is important. The angle of your hands play a defining role in it. The angle of uh, putting the uh, nib of the pen on the paper of how you just uh, write the, the specific letters and the words uh, uh, plays an important part. Now, if you look at these physical and the spiritual elements and the mental elements of what is included in, in doing calligraphy, in doing asalir, and, and many other, uh, uh, other styles of uh, calligraphy, you see that it's, it is a kind of an art for the perfection of the human beings. The, the calligrapher and also the recipient of that calligraphy, the one who's actually viewing it, who doesn't have the craft, who doesn't have the arts to do it, they, they still enjoy it. And of course it adds something to the experience that they've got of that, of that uh, calligraphy, of that art. So when we talk about Nasali calligraphy, of course, it, there is an element of language in it. If you do not know the Persian language or the Arabic language, you would not be able to figure out what it says. I mean, the text uh, will, will, will remain alien to you. It would, it, you would not be able to connect with it. But it is also mainly about graphics, about the beauty of, of what you see. It's, it's the aesthetics elements of it, which is, which is really important. So knowing the language is, of course, very helpful. And it deepens the pleasure that you get from, from seeing a, a work of calligraphy. But it is primarily about the graphics and the aesthetics because when you see a work of art which is done in, in a perfect style, which is done masterfully, you do not even need to know the language. You could immediately perceive something, you could immediately pick up that, 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 that element of beauty, which is, which is pleasing to the eye, which is pleasing to the soul. So in calligraphy, we're dealing with shape, we're dealing with angles, we're dealing with curves. So you see, uh, getting the proportions right in putting these shapes and angles and letters and words together is very critical, it's very important. Now, all of this is achieved through practice. You need to regularly spend time on it. You need to be patient. You need to have that kind of perseverance required of you to really master each and every single uh, uh, aspect of doing calligraphy. Because when we start doing calligraphy, you, you start with basic lines and with basic dots. And then over time, you become such an expert in it that you just do not need to think. It automatically flows from your fingers and from the, the way you hold your, your, your pen. So calligraphy uh, in, in the history of, of its evolution in, 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 in Muslim cultures, in, in, uh, uh, particularly in the Persian and the Arabic language, is connected, is interconnected with other forms of art, which, which gradually were associated with it and they were closely connected with it. Now, these forms of art include illumination, tahzib, uh, book binding, which is called tajlid, paper tinting, pigment making, historiated painting, painting, which is uh, called tashir. Now, all of these, these arts, which are closely connected with calligraphy, I mean, a, a calligrapher writes something on a piece of paper, then it is given some to, to an artist who's an expert on illumination. Then uh, uh, those uh, sheets of paper, which are done in calligraphy, are bound together. And uh, they, they could appear on the, on, the, on the binding of the book as well. And 
In order to do calligraphy, you need to do paper tinting, you need to color the papers, you need to make the proper pa uh, the paper, you need to produce the kind of ink that you need to use, you need the pigments uh, to work on. And you see it becomes a huge uh, 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 area of work. It, it's it's, it's, it's uh, a vast uh, ocean that you, as you go along, you will discover new things in, in the art of calligraphy as you do it. So they're closely connected with books, with how books have been produced over the centuries. And, and, and as a result, it is, it is part of the uh, literary heritage of, of Muslim cultures. But to put it more broadly, I think it is, it is closely connected with how we understand humanism as it has evolved among Muslims. So, it has evolved over centuries and it keeps evolving. I mean, the way we, we know that we, we can study is we see that it's evolving. If you look at the masters of calligraphy today, you would see that they are introducing new uh, ways of doing calligraphy, new ways of writing certain letters, certain words, uh, certain uh, movements. And th that is an indication of how this, this art uh, evolves, not just in matters of century, but even also in matters of decade it changes as, as we go along. So if you want to look at uh, uh, how calligraphy is done, we need, of course, we need to look at the tools of the craft itself, which is also an art. So the basic tools that we need is, of course, paper or parchment. Without paper, you cannot write on, on, on water. You need to have the right kind of paper. Then you need the pen, which are reed spans. They are properly carved and finely sanded, which is very important of how you get the good quality pen that you need to do calligraphy with. Then you need the ink, which is produced usually traditionally, but also in more recent times, they are produced industrially. We've got the inkwell, which is the container in which you hold the, uh, uh, the, the ink and you pour the ink in. We need something called the wadding or the licha, which are fine, silk threads in order to keep the ink together in the ink well and so that it doesn't spill so that you can actually control the flow of the ink on the on the pen when you're doing the, the calligraphy. We also need pure distilled water. Now traditionally it used to be rose water to dilute the ink. Uh, of course you do not you do not use that very thick ink that which is initially produced because you need, you need to be able to see the shadows of how you, you draw the lines and it actually helps the uh, you know, progress that you make in doing calligraphy and also it adds to the beauty of it, which is why you need distilled water, which is why you need to dilute your ink and you do not uh, directly use uh, that kind of uh, ink, unless it is uh, some industrialized, uh, industrially produced inks which actually allow you to be able to control them a lot easier than the traditional inks which are, which are produced in these days. We've got something called the Arabic sand. It is, it is something, uh, it is a sticky glue-like uh, liquid, which uh, the substance actually helps hold the ink together. So the distilled water dilutes it, but the sand is actually trying holding the ink together so that it doesn't just spill over when you're, when you, when you're doing the writing. There is another something, uh, another uh, uh, tool that uh, calligraphers very often use. They call it a mat or a pad. They call it zirdasti to put it in, to use the Persian word for it. And you, it's it's uh, usually made of, of leather or uh, thick leather. I mean, it's 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 flexible. You can keep it under your hand, and you could, uh, uh, while you're doing the calligraphy, you see that there's something flexible and soft underneath your hand, and the calligraphy itself is not done on a, on a very uh, rough or a very uh, very uh, uh, thick, uh, 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 very flat uh, to, to put it like this, very flat uh, surface. So if you go back to the parchments, of course, in the past and present, you they, many uh, calligraphers use starched paper which is produced by hand, which is called Kogaz Ahar. Now this starched paper is, is, is one of those very incredible things that, that is very practical. And also people will actually start producing these starched paper on their own uh, so that it, it, you, it wouldn't really cost them a lot of money. They could actually get the starch, they could uh, use the papers and then uh, uh, very easily use that one to uh, go ahead with uh, the, the production of the paper, which is suitable for your kind of work. There are also handmade marble paper, which is the Kogaza Aprobot, which is nowadays also produced industrially. It is printed and people could go and buy them in calligraphy stores. Now, 
choosing the kind of paper to uh, do calligraphy on very much depends on the kind of ink that you use and it depends on your taste. Now, there are people who are much more inclined to use a, a start paper or a provide paper. Now, for purposes of learning and, and uh, beginning to do calligraphy, very often gloss paper is used because it is, it is easier to handle than you could put a pen on it easily and, you could, and the ink flows on it uh, without, without really big, big, any, any kind of struggle on it. When we come to the Qalam thing, the Qalams are the, the pens are carved out of reed mostly, and sometimes they're made out of wood and they're finely carved and then uh, and, and sharpened. So uh, you need a professional pen knife, you need a Qalam Tarash. You've got a long uh, uh, steel uh, blade, which is designed for carving uh, reed. It is not a kitchen knife, it is not any kind of a Swiss knife. So you need a particular kind of Qalam Tarash. It is often found in countries like Iran, you find a, 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 the proper kinds of pen knives also in places like Syria, but it is still, it's not impossible to, to look for these kinds of Alam Tarak. I mean, if, if you if you live in Europe, if you live in North America, you could even go to, to different websites that produce these, these kinds of pen knives. But the key thing is that you don't need a, a curved uh, knife. You need a straight, uh, 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 very sharp, uh, steel blade to be able to handle the kind of thing that you, the kind of uh, uh, pan carving that you need. So this art of, uh, of, of carving the pan is itself something which is part and parcel of doing calligraphy. And it's not an easy thing to handle. It takes years sometimes for people to be able to become really uh, uh, good carvers of the pen, and, and it's, it's, it's a very fascinating thing to do. I mean, you start uh, carving those pens and then testing them when you're doing the, the uh, actual calligraphy, and then you would see how, how deeply pleasing it is to engage with that. It's, it's in a sense like doing carpentry, carpentry, but in a very fine way. So the, 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 the craft of doing that kind of uh, carving of the pen has got very delicate techniques that you, there are rules to it and you cannot just randomly just cut a read and, and uh, imagine that, okay, it's, this, is, this is the kind of pen that I need for doing calligraphy on. The final point, which is really important about doing, doing uh, uh, carving the pen is that uh, masters of calligraphy often tell you that you do not uh, carve the pens, you do not sharpen the pens very frequently, you only do the spelling. You do it finely in the first place, you do a very nice uh, carving of it, and then you keep working on it until it's no longer functional. And at that time, then you start sharpening it, and, and then you uh, begin carving the pen, you take new layers off it, and then you uh, uh, work uh, on, on, on a new uh, uh, nib of the pen, if you like. So the ink, which was traditionally produced uh, for doing calligraphy was uh, usually made of soot or walnut skin or different different uh, kinds of uh, fruits, which would produce the kind of color that you would need for uh, doing calligraphy. Uh, in professional industrial ones that, that you've got there are a number of, a number of brands that people will easily find as this Japanese Daiso, uh, ink, or it's otherwise called sumi. It's a, a, a kind of uh, liquid ink for doing calligraphy. We've got the German Schminke. It's an acrylic uh, ink, which is very good for doing uh, uh, calligraphy on the on on a hard paper, on starch paper. Now, as I said before, all traditional inks need dilution, and they need to be put in silk threads for use. And that that idea of the of the lira or the silk thread to keep the ink together is, 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 is very much important, very much helpful because you don't accidentally spill your ink and you can always carry it with you without, without much uh, uh, trouble. As it's really important to have that, those, those kinds of silk threads in the uh, ink world with you. And it is of course becomes part and parcel of the calligraphy. Now, the ink well sizes might be different but the key thing is that they need to be airtight so that they don't, I mean, the, the, the liquid, the water, and it doesn't evaporate very quickly and the ink doesn't get dry. So uh, you, you need to be able to sustain it for quite a while. Now the ink well shouldn't be too deep. I mean, you should be able to put your pen, dip your 
pin into the inkwell comfortably without any kind of trouble. So you don't have to just dip it too deep. And then it shouldn't be also a very uh, thin surface. You need to be able to handle it uh, without any, any trouble. Now, the key thing about the ink uh, well is, is the size of it, the shape of it, and most importantly, the functionality of it. It's not just the ornaments on the inkwell. People get carried away with all these ornaments and inkwells that they find, but of course, those are mainly used for, for display rather than for practical day-to-day -day functional use of the inkwell. So I mentioned this before when we talk about the wadding or the lira, these are the threads that keep the ink together. When you dip them, uh, dip your pen in it, it should not get too soggy. So the amount of uh, uh, ink that you put in it, in, in, into the lira, the amount of uh, 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 pure water that you add uh, to the pure distilled water or rose water that you add to it is also important to be able to handle it together. And you would learn it over time. I mean, you, you would have to experience, experiment with it several times so that you really get the hang of it. So when you're just uh, uh, dipping the pen in it, this is called, this is called murakkab bagdari, so taking the sufficient amount of uh, ink to do calligraphy with. You, you need a thin layer, uh, uh, for, for the kind of uh, shorter letter that you need. And you need a little bit of a, of a thicker layer of, of ink to do longer ones when you're doing the kashidas or when you're doing the mats, the elongation of letters, and you may dip it a little bit more to get more ink. So as I said, the amount of ink that you uh, take, it depends on how much you've, you've worked with the ink, uh, uh, how much you've put the ink through the lira and, the, and how much you've diluted this. And you get it over time. You will learn how to deal with it. Now, one of the uh, techniques that many calligraphers do is that when they dip the pen uh, into the inkwell, very often it happens that you take more ink that you really need. So they would, they would actually uh, remove some of them when they put it in the back of their fingers or the back of their thumb, uh, so that you could see it. It's, of course, it makes your hand dirty, but it allows you to be able to control the amount of ink that you use to do calligraphy. Now this desk mat or desk pad is, is something which is like I said, made uh, of leather. Uh, uh, you put it on your paper, it helps soften the touch. It also allows the control of the pen. Now the paper itself should not rest on a hard surface like a table. You may start doing that, but as you use a, a uh, soft uh, surface, a soft mat like a leather, you would see that it makes a significant difference to uh, uh, the kind of calligraphy that you do and the way you practice it. So you could even use a pad of paper if you don't have uh, uh, leather at your disposal. You could easily use a, a pad of A4 papers or uh, put a magazine underneath your hand and, and start working on it rather than just putting it on a marbled or a glass uh, uh, table or a wooden table, which is, which is very uh, hard. So flexibility is really critical when you're doing that kind of uh, uh, work. So again, I'm going into the details of what I've explained so far is the tools for preparing the pens. So when you, of course, when you begin with the pens itself, there are differences in pens. So the range of pens, some of them are made of bamboo, some of them are made of reed, and also there are wooden ones. So the texture needs to be quite uh, sturdy or sturdy enough to allow a longer uh, uh, writing, to endure longer writing with them. So what you need for nibbling the pen, of course, you need a pen, then you would need a pen knife, which I discussed a little bit earlier, made of steel. Then you need a nibbling block, which is usually made of uh, animal horns or made of wood. Now this is uh, called qatzan. So this block helps you actually do the final uh, stage of doing the uh, uh, cutting or the nibbling of the pen uh, that you've got. After that one, you need sandpaper. You need fine sandpaper to polish and smoothen those rough edges which are produced when you're doing the cutting of the, the actual cutting of the pen, which are uh, more advanced stages for, uh, uh, for people who've got longer experience with, with doing calligraphy rather than for beginners. Because the people who've just started doing calligraphy, they would usually give it to a teacher, somebody who's experienced with uh, carving the pens, and they would, they would do a reasonably good job of, of giving them the right kind of pen that they need. So, I'm going to have a quick look at the kinds of styles that we have got in calligraphy and how they look like. 
So uh, the image on the right is an, is, is a, is an example of the Nask uh, style. And you could see that the, 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 the element of straight lines is, is, is quite visible in it. The one on the right is, is uh, a 16th century calligraphy, uh, which is written by Mir Ali, one of the great masters of, uh, of, of Nask style. And you could see that if you compare it with, with uh, contemporary styles of doing calligraphy, it's significantly different. And it, it, you could also see the evolution of, of the Nastali script in them. So the one on the left is Nast, the one on the right is Nastali. Now, there is something in calligraphy called sat, writing a sat, writing a sentence, writing a line. Sat means a line, basically. So in, 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 in a line, rather than two rows, in one, one straight line, they write a verse of poetry or the right of verse of the Quran or a, a sentence and it is called right doing doing the sat so right doing the sat is is an important part of uh, uh, the job of learning calligraphy many many beginners start practicing like that until they get to the highest stages of doing calligraphy we've got this other style you could see it in the image which is called chalipa which is basically that you have four lines of uh, of uh, calligraphy uh, and, and of course, they should be they should be they should be aligned properly. The top two lines are just in the same in the same alignment. Then the, the bottom two lines move a little bit further up, and again they are aligned. So the the style of them, the, the way that you actually uh, uh, position those uh, uh, lines is particularly important, and it is a design of a chalipa. So chalipa has got four lines in it. It's the, the straightforward way of 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 understanding it, and it's not a straight line. It's not like it's not like doing doing it in a in a, in a shape of uh, so when you look at those those uh, lines they don't form a kind of a uh, of a square it's it's a little bit more uh, uh, elongated on, on the sides then we've got this style of siamash the one that you see here now this is again one of the siamash by Mirza Ghulam Zawani the line which is written there it says maghom aslima gushe kharabat as khodash in This is a verse by Hafiz. Now, the key thing about doing Siyah Mashk is that Siyah Mashk is primarily about the beauty of the uh, of getting out the words and the letters and doing the elongations and doing the combination of letters together. Now, it is not immediately uh, legible. Uh, you, you do not necessarily recognize the letters from the very beginning because when you look at it, after a few seconds, you might be able to figure out what it's written there. But the key thing is that it's the striking uh, beauty of doing that, those, those kinds of shapes, which is important in doing Siyah Mashk. You know, Siyah Mashk, Siyah means black, Mashk means doing practicing, doing writing. So it's as if you're just, you keep writing on a piece of paper, words are just uh, interfering in one another. So there is no separation, there is no space in, in doing the Omar Bethlehem. Then there is a higher level of doing uh, calligraphy when you move a little bit past doing uh, 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 writing sats, which is called Kitabat. Now, when you're doing Kitabat, you people do the Kitabat with a, with a, a much smaller size uh, uh, pens. So it's, it's it's very fine. It's very small. It's not very, it's not easy to handle it. So you need you need to have already practice doing with the with the uh, mashri uh, pens, which is called the, uh, the the practice pens or called mashri pens, depending on the on, on the length of the nib that you've got. Uh, so when people are just giving their exam taking their examinations in calligraphy, so kitabat is a little bit is a higher level than doing the primary and the intermediate doing of. Uh, uh, calligraphy examination, which shows how you're able to handle different sizes of the nibs of the pen that you've got. Now, in case of Kitaba, there is no limitation like that. You could write several lines on it, you could write a passage, you could write, a, I don't know, a text, you could write a full poem. So it's the key thing is how you manage to handle the size of those uh, pens that you've got. So, Learning and teaching uh, calligraphy is, as I said, it's just like a spiritual practice. Now, so let me show you that, that Siyah Mash on the, on the right hand side again. It is Siyah Mash again by Mirza Ghulam Rubai Swani. It says, 
الختو مخفی یون فی تعلیم الوستاد انت رسو بلیز الاسم تلت از قوامه هو فی کسرت المشق اتز تلگرفی is hidden in the teaching and the instruction of the teacher and its integrity and its progress and development uh, lies in doing uh, extensive uh, practice. So is it possible to learn calligraphy on your own? Yeah, as far as you could reach a spiritual enlightenment on your own, yes. It's, uh, can you uh, get to the higher levels of knowledge on your own? Very rarely, yes, it is possible. It isn't impossible, there's nothing impossible in the world. But like any, any, any form of uh, art, like any form of craft, like, like any kind of business, you always need a teacher. When you want to learn mathematics, when you want to learn chemistry, physics, any kind of educational education that you need, you always need a teacher. So the ta'aleem element is fundamentally important to learning calligraphy. And it works best when you have access to a living, present teacher. You need somebody to physically see. You need to have access to that person. Of course, people in nowadays are online, but it takes much longer. You could look at the works of earlier uh, uh, masters, and there, there's a name for it. They call it Mashkan Azali. So you could, you could actually look, you could actually observe, you could view what uh, a, a, a master in the past has written. And then look at the way uh, that they've actually uh, uh, produced the letters and the combinations, then you would easily be able to imitate them. So it's a matter of imitation as well. But when you have a teacher, the teacher would tell you things, uh, very uh, fine uh, tips which are given to you by the teacher that you cannot find in, the, in a book which is published or even in, in an online session. There's, there's, there's a, there's a find a delicate thing in learning something directly from a teacher, particularly when it has to do with calligraphy. But as I said, it's not impossible. I mean, you can make progress on your own if you have the passion, if you really don't, don't um, if, if your, your passion doesn't burn out and you could continue for years and years and years doing calligraphy without any teacher and just going through all the difficulty of it, yes, you might be able to make progress. So what is it that you learn? Of course, the initial thing is the techniques of how to create and handle the curves and the dots. So as you move forward, what you learn is how to produce graphically beautiful and aesthetically impressive works so that you enjoy it and the viewers enjoy it as well. So producing that one harmony is critical. You need to be able to internalize the right proportions. You could say it is a golden ratio uh, that, that is used in mathematics as well. So, what you have here is you've got mathematics, you've got art, you've got esotericism. The reason I say esotericism is that there is something, there are deeper layers in it. Uh, I, I say there is a lot of notice in it because it's uh, calligraphy, the carrier of wisdom, as I'll say shortly. So the next point is in uh, uh, about, about doing calligraphy is spacing. Spacing is very critical. The, the, not, the amount of space that you add between letters and between words and the way that you actually fill the empty spaces is the most important thing in, be able to, in being able to produce a good work of calligraphy. So your hand, your mind, and your eyes need to be trained so that you could, when you put your hand on the paper, you, 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 you place your pen, with the right angle on the paper when you're actually doing, for example, a, a dot or when you're doing an alif, the, 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 kind of, the kind of angle that you need to actually put your hand on is, is very critical and you learn it over time. As you keep practicing it, your mind automatically gets adapt, uh, adjusted to it and then you will be able to learn it. So you have to use the right distance between your eyes and between the paper, which is really 30 to 40 centimeters. So the space between your eyes and the paper is important, not too close, not too far. You've also got to choose the right side of the pen. If the pen is too big uh, for your hand, if the pen is uh, too small, and then you would have difficulty in it. But yes, if, if you become a master calligrapher, you could write with anything. It's, 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 not, it's, not, it's not difficult. But if you're beginning to learn, you need to choose the right size of pen, which is, which is important to beginning to go. So in early stages, the uh, right size for the practice pens, for the Alama Mashri, is something between two to six millimeters, which is the, uh, uh, the nib of the pen as, as you've cut it. 
So what is the next level? The next level in calligraphy, I'm not talking about the, the levels of, of, of professionalism in, in calligraphy, I'm talking about a higher level of a digestive language. So calligraphy is done with, often it's done with poetry. So when we look at, for example, the Persian poetry, which is extremely rich, and even today it's still vibrant, it's living, people can, can connect with it, uh, they, can, they can access the meanings in it. It is not something, a language of a distant generation that, that is impossible for the ordinary person to read it and understand it. Everybody reads the poetry of Hafez and Khayyam and Rumi these days. Now, in doing calligraphy, it is that, that poetry which guides us. So the content of what you read, you, you, you write, is closely connected with the way that you actually learn calligraphy and you, you make progress with it and you, you develop with it. Now, this poetry is a carrier, it's a vehicle for wisdom. It contains those elements, those, those uh, uh, centuries old wisdom that you find in, in human cultures and in human life. And it is something which guides people, which brings light to them, which brings enlightenment to them, which brings direction to their life, which brings happiness to them. And of course, it's a reflection of their, uh, uh, their emotions. It's a reflection of their happiness, their joy, their sadness, their grief. And as a result, it is closely connected with, as I said, with, with, with wisdom. So when we talk about calligraphy, we're not just talking about an art, we're also talking about a vessel, a propeller, propeller for wisdom, if you like. Then we've got something that I call the music of sounds and letters because I believe that letters have their own music too. Uh, so the more harmonious, the more delicate the curves, the more appealing they will look to you. It's like just playing the violin or playing the guitar or the sitar. If you do not do the notes right, it's, it's uh, disturbing to your ear. The same happens with, with your eyes. When you see something which doesn't have any harmony in it, which doesn't have any proportions in it, it disturbs you. It doesn't look appealing to you, which is why I call it music. There is a sound to it. Now, this nostalgia itself is closely associated with Persian music. Now, here's the connection the way I see it. If you look at, remember where we started with, with poetry, our poetry is, has got some rules. Our the classical Persian poetry is closely associated, related to the classical mm, Persian music, if you like. The kind of modalities that you've got are related to the kind of rhymes and meters that you have in, uh, in poetry. So we've got the same poetry, which is written down in calligraphy. And uh, many of these calligraphers in the past are also familiar with, uh, with music, with musical instruments, with the kind of modalities which existed in, in Persian music, and it, it helped them understand and figure out and enjoy uh, the kind of calligraphy that they were doing. So here I want to talk a little bit about the curves, which are, which are what I call the higher levels of mastery of doing calligraphy. So, You've got curves in nature, you've got curves in art, and you've got curves in love. Uh, by love, I mean human passions, you mean whatever, whatever you see in your life that you enjoy, that that element of harmony in curves is, 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 is something unmissable by anybody uh, who's, who's got a sharp eye. So letters, as I said, have the music too. Now, the more harmonious, the more delicate the curves are done in calligraphy. This is what called for the, the, the diorat or the doors the more appealing uh, your calligraphy will look. I mean, if you're doing a noon, if you're doing a, a lam, which has got its own, it's, it's, its curve, its door, its diorat, it, it takes quite a long time to be able to master it, to, to, to produce it with the right harmony, with the right proportions. And at that stage, it usually suggests, it, it can tell you that you're, you're now gradually making, uh, taking longer strides towards becoming a master of doing calligraphy. That is again why I think there is an association between Nastali and music as well, because at least the, the more you're able to, to, to handle those delicate points of doing, for example, the, the uh, glissandos in, 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 in music and singing, uh, the, the more capable you are in, in, in doing the chanting and doing the recitation and doing the awards in, 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 in music. So the same applies to Nasalim. So what we have in the in the modalities of, of music, 
it is it is probably reflected in the way that you you perform the uh, the curves in in Nastali calligraphy. So where do you approach the cruising level? When you handle these curves correctly, you begin to really uh, to, uh, uh, to be on top of those. So when you observe the right slant in the elongations in the cachetas or in the mats, when you manage to compose, this is called called tab keep, to compose and set the letters and words in, in, a, in a peaceful and a perfect harmony with the right proportions, then it means that you are uh, arriving at the cruising level of doing calligraphy. So these are some of the kind, some kinds of stages. Some of the stages uh, used uh, in the literature they use these these terms to refer to different stages of of having learned calligraphy. So you've got beauty of formation. You've got husn tashki when you put letters and words together. You've got the beauty of disposition husn abas that the kind of position that you have for different letters in, in relation to different words in relation to other words. Then when you've achieved these things, it leads to what, what calligraphers, master calligraphers have called dignity. They're called shan and refinement or safa, which usually indicates that you're really at the highest stages, at the most advanced stages of having learned calligraphy. So from here, like higher stages of science, art, and mysticism, you enter in different high level ranks and realms of doing, doing the, the craft that you've got. Now there is this uh, poem by Mir Ali Harabi. I'm going to read it in Farsi and then read the translation for you. It says, "Chand dar vadi khat sarf koni nakh de hayat bishnu az van sukhaniyo benishin farak bal." Panch chizast ki to jam nagar dar baham hast hatat shudan nazd khirat amre mahad. Dikat tabu vuhi zkhato qovat darst. I think there's a little bit of exaggeration in it, but the, the, the message is very clear and it's very important. These are what you would call the simple rules and the requirements of becoming a calligrapher. He says, you spend the precious moments of your life in the field of calligraphy, so let me give you a word of advice, and then you can relax. There are five things you need to become a calligrapher. Without a combination of all these, it is impossible to become a calligrapher. A fine taste, knowledge of techniques, a strong hand, endurance, and a complete set of writing tools. I would suggest that the first one is, is that the last one is most important. Without a complete set of writing tools, you wouldn't be able to really make good progress. And then it says, if any one of these five falls short, it will be a futile job even if you try for a hundred years. So before wrapping this up together, I'd like to introduce some references, some important works in English, because there are, uh, uh, there's an infinite number of works written in, 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 in Parsi uh, throughout centuries, which are really helpful, which are uh, important. And contemporary masters have also produced a lot of, a lot of books, which would be uh, very important guides. Uh, so I'm not going to get into those those books uh, because I, I primarily I'm, I'm trying to do this in English so that the English speaking audience could actually get, get a hang of this. So the first one is this uh, uh, major work by the late Anwar Shimmel. This it's called the Calligraphy and Islamic Culture. It was it was published in 1983. It's a very thorough and classical work. The author, of course, was well versed in Persian literature, in Muslim culture, in mysticism. She was an expert on Rumi, and she knew the cultures and languages of the subcontinent very well. Uh, and so she she had very deep knowledge of of uh, uh, Muslim communities, which is understandable why he's putting that term. Islamic culture and it because the immediate uh, point of contact for uh, uh, for uh, calligraphy was of course with, with uh, Muslim cultures, with Muslim languages, with Muslim literature. Uh, you might have seen the gravestone of Anwar Shimal, uh, Anwar Shimal and on, on the tomb there is this line, there is this hadith of the prophet written in, in Nasali calligraphy. It says, and no sunyaman is a motu in tabahu. People are dead. People are asleep. When well, the moment they die, they wake up from their slumber. And she took that, that, that kind of legacy with her to the grave. And of course, she, she, she's always well remembered. She's 
played a very significant role in introducing Muslim cultures and these the art of Western community. A other one, the other book, which is one of the important books, is, is the uh, book uh, produced by Sheila Blair. Uh, uh, she's a retired professor of Islamic and Asian arts, and art. she's an art historian. It's a rather recent book. It was published in 2008 by Edinburgh University Press. It's called Islamic Calligraphy. And as far as I understand, it is also translated into Persian. This is also one of those uh, classic works that people could actually read thoroughly and learn a lot about uh, about uh, calligraphy. And again, she's also putting the same title, Islamic calligraphy in it. I find it a little bit, a little bit more uh, inclusive, if you like, than just being Islamic. But the way that, that these authors are using, are using the term Islamic, I do not think it has got anything to do with a specific confessional identity. Maybe it's better to use the term that, that was used by Marshall Hudson, it was the Islamic cat world, which is inclusive of many cultures and traditions and languages and people of different faiths and backgrounds. There is a, a later one. This is an, an updated entry in the Islamica uh, Encyclopedia Islamica, uh, uh, which is published by Brill. Uh, so in volume five, there is an entry on calligraphy. Uh, it's written by multiple authors. It's published in 2015, but the original uh, 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 Entry was published in the Greater Islamic Encyclopedia, Dayat al Ma'arif of the Islami, which is published in Persian in Iran. Now, this one is, is a translation of the same encyclopedia with an extended version of it, and put the old at times abridging some, some articles, but it is produced in English, published by Prill. It's produced by the Institute of Ismaili Studies. Now, in this article, you would see a lot of those terms, a lot of the history of that one. So if anybody really wants to get a first-hand detailed knowledge of, of calligraphy, uh, it is recommended to just have a look at this, this entry, which appears in volume five of the Encyclopedia Islamica. And finally, there is this most recent book, which has just come out by Brill again, a handbook of Persian calligraphy and related arts by Hamid uh, uh, Khani the image below and it's been edited uh, and uh, 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 taken care of by uh, my colleague Dr. Shervin Tariq Najat. Uh, you would find this book particularly important, a very good resource for learning about terms of calligraphy and their styles in English. Now the reason I, uh, I, I decided to give you a, a, a an overview of some of these references is that if anybody wants to do any kind of research on it, quite aside from doing it, the job of, of, of calligraphy as, as art, they would learn a lot by having a, a glance at these books and it would be a, a lovely experience to read them through. So thank you very much for listening and uh, staying with me. So uh, if you've got any comments, you could leave comments on my YouTube channel. Uh, and, if you would like to uh, stay up to date and, and uh, follow up any kind of other presentations in related fields, make sure you click on the subscribe button, uh, which is on the left-hand side, or if you look at it from the front, it's on the right-hand side of the video that you see. And you will be notified of any video which is uploaded or any live, uh, live stream event which is uh, showing up on uh, YouTube. Thank you very much. Have a lovely time.